Beneath a magnificent desert in the southeastern corner of the state of New Mexico is a place of great contrast and unusual beauty. A place where true discoveries are still possible for everyone who visits. A place where solid rock gives way to huge voids and sculptures poured over millions of years into otherworldly shapes. If you are willing to step beyond the familiar, join us on a journey into a realm of sights which will challenge your imagination to a place of danger and wonder where an unusual world is revealed to those with a spirit of exploration. Carlsbad Caverns National Park sits atop a Permian Age reef that once ringed an inland sea more than 230 million years ago. These mountains were a part of that reef now called the Guadalupes, they are the greatest exposure of ancient reef rock in the world. The Permian Sea and the Great Capitan Reef were near the equator when the reef was forming. When the conditions were perfect, the reef grew quickly. The organisms forming the reef were mostly algae, sponges, and primitive shellfish. Their fossil remains can be seen, preserved in limestone. They were bound together by marine cements and then compressed through the ages, forming the Capitan Massif, the limestone layer in the mountains in which most of the great caves of the Guadalupes are formed. Exposed by erosion, it can be seen in beautifully towering fins of limestone rock at the mouth of Slaughter Canyon in the park backcountry. Most caves of the world form as a result of water, usually rainwater, seeping into the ground. As the water picks up carbon dioxide in the soil, it forms a weak solution of carbonic acid which dissolves the underlying rock, creating cave passages. These passages interconnect and may have constantly flowing underground streams or rivers. The caves in the Guadalupe Mountains form in a much different manner. Hydrogen sulfide migrating into the reef from deep oil and gas reservoirs millions of years ago met with fresh water seeping down from above. The reaction with the oxygen in the water produced sulfuric acid which is very corrosive to limestone. The caves dissolved mostly along the joints and cracks developed in the reef through compression and mountain building forces. This process seems to create very large passages which end abruptly and have entrances formed as surface collapse occurs or because of the down cutting of canyons through erosion. Passages can form deep within the reef without connecting to the surface or with other cave passages. of Carlsbad Cavern and other caves in the park are among the largest known underground chambers in the world. The big room of Carlsbad Cavern is a quarter mile from one end to the other, an area big enough for 30 football fields. The ceiling reaches a height of 256 feet. It is filled with formations of great size and beauty. A three and one half mile trail winds through the cave beginning at the natural entrance and ending with a one mile loop around this huge chamber. The 
big room can be reached by elevator from the surface, and there is wheelchair access. The first humans explored the Guadalupe Mountains as early as 20,000 years ago. By 6,000 BC, archaic people were painting these symbols in natural shelters along steep canyon walls. There is ample evidence that early man used caves for shelter, safety, and as a water source. In the entrance to Carlsbad Cavern alone, there are over 80 examples of archaic rock art some on precarious ledges extending well out over the dark void. There is evidence that prehistoric people did venture into the cavern's huge first chamber, into the twilight zone, where for several months each summer afternoon, the sun's rays are focused into a shaft of light that illuminates the humid atmosphere. Even in modern times, it is an awesome sight. And actually without the water vapor, the the park interpretive staff case. conducts after-hours tours into the natural entrance. The tours continue into the cavern, where visitors light their way by candle lantern. There is no evidence as yet that primitive man ventured past this spectacle and into the dark inner regions. But it is interesting to speculate. Was the spirit of exploration strong enough to push the ancient ones to become the first humans to penetrate the dark zone? And did they, like the great shaft of light, simply illuminate its wonders and leave without a trace? Without such evidence, the story of exploration must begin with a shy cowboy named James Larkin White. In 1901, White was camping in the Guadalupe Mountains when he saw what appeared to be smoke over the next ridge and went to investigate. The smoke turned out to be a vast column of bats, millions of them boiling out of a huge cave entrance into the hazy clouds of a New Mexican sunset. White returned the next day and with a homemade ladder of rope, wire, and sticks, climbed down into the great mouth of the cave, thus beginning a cycle of exploration and discovery that continues to this day. The bats that attracted White attracted others with more economic motives. Bat droppings, or guano, make excellent fertilizer. In 1903, Abijah Long filed the cave's first guano mining claim. Jim White soon became his foreman. During 20 years of mining, seven different companies tried to turn a profit by extracting over 100,000 tons of guano from the cave. Most of it shipped to the citrus fields of Southern California. The job as foreman allowed White to explore the cavern in his spare time, and he became its unofficial guide. Convinced that people should see the wonders of the great cave, Jim built trails to make walking easier and conducted tours. Visitors were lowered 173 feet down into the cave in the bucket used to haul guano. Jim White worked for six guano operations and all the while continued to explore, usually alone, seeing more of the cave's wonders for the first time than any other man. These old newsreel pictures show Jim walking through the cave with a magnesium photo torch. Long before the cave had paved trails, electric lights, or elevators. Through his efforts, Carlsbad Cave became a national monument in 1923, with Jim White its first ranger. President Herbert Hoover declared Carlsbad Caverns the nation's 26th national park in 1930. Since that time, the park has grown to over 47,000 acres of the Guadalupe Mountains. The mission of the park has grown far beyond the primitive tours conducted by James Larkin White. The bats which attracted Jim White to the entrance of Carlsbad Cavern have been attracting a steady audience ever since. In the summer, rangers give nightly programs about the world's only flying mammal. The aim is to dispel many of the myths about a most misunderstood and wrongly feared creature. In fact, bats, 
the second most numerous of mammal species, are some of the most beneficial creatures on Earth. This colony, made up of Mexican free-tail bats, exit the cavern every evening to feed mainly on flying insects like moths and mosquitoes. Snatching their prey out of the night sky using a process of echolocation. The colony spends the winter months in Mexico. They mate in the spring and return to the cavern in May to give birth and raise their young. By July, the babies have joined the flight and the colony can number up to a million. They swirl up and out of the cave in a rotating column, gaining speed with each revolution until they have enough lift to make it up and over the edge of the entrance and into the desert. They will fly up to 50 miles each night. That is, unless they fall prey to one of the red-tailed hawks that frequent the entrance area, repeatedly diving the column, hoping to snatch a meal out of the sky. The summer flight that Jim White witnessed in 1901 may have had as many as 7 million bats in it. But the use of pesticides mainly DDT in the United States and Mexico, and disturbances caused by guano mining in the early days contributed to the colony's decline. It takes the colony until well after dark to exit the cave. Then, near dawn, the majority return, bellies full. Not in the wild undulating column in which they left, but in small groups. They tuck in their translucent wings of delicate skin, and at up to 60 miles per hour, rocket back into the dark void, wings buzzing. While best known for its caves, Carlsbad Caverns National Park is, on the surface, a naturalist's playground. Over 200 million years of geologic process has been exposed by erosion and uplift. More than 50 miles of backcountry trails cross the 47,000-acre park. Because of the lack of water in this northeastern part of the Chihuahuan Desert, most visitors avoid hiking and miss the beauty of the backcountry. In the spring, as if to signal the return of the Mexican free-tail bats, desert flowers bloom, dotting the usually arid landscape with bright colors. But if one looks closely, or waits for the right moment, the desert will reveal forms and shapes beyond its pale green facade. Animal life in the desert requires an even closer look. Around the entrance, rock squirrels seem to ignore the steady stream of visitors. And collared lizards bask on the hot rocks with seeming indifference. But most desert animals rely on stealth and concealment to survive. So it is rare to see a Mexican tarantula or a Texas banded gecko, although both frequent the cavern entrance. The largest nesting colony of cave swallows in the United States lives in the cavern's natural entrance. Snakes are rarely seen. Usually avoiding the desert heat, they hunt mostly at night. The long-nosed snake feeds mainly on lizards. The checkered garter snake prefers greener areas of the park. The most likely spot to see one is down at Rattlesnake Springs. Most snakes in the park are not venomous, but there are several rattlesnake species. The black-tailed rattlesnake eats small mammals like mice and sometimes lizards. It usually grows to no more than four feet in length. But the diamondback can reach over six feet. They eat small mammals, including bats. Diamondbacks sometimes wait at the entrance during a bat flight, hoping to catch a fallen bat. It's very rare to see any snake in the desert, especially on park trails. So hiking in the park backcountry is relatively safe, provided you are ready to meet the desert on its own terms. You must be ready for rough trails and weather changes, and always 
bring plenty of water. The water table is far below the surface of the Capitan Reef. The park pumps its water from a spring a thousand feet below the visitor center in the ancient sea basin to the south of the reef. Rattlesnake Springs, which is a detached portion of the park, is an oasis in the otherwise arid gypsum plain. Here, because of the abundance of water, there are large shade trees and grassy fields which attract wildlife. The springs are on the main flyway for migratory birds between the western United States and Mexico and are a favorite stop for bird watchers. Huge turkey vultures take the morning sun, warming their wings in the cottonwoods. A great variety of smaller birds forage for food in the cool morning light, while a hawk watches the grounds for a chance meal. The birds are most active in the mornings and evenings when the desert is cooler. And although camping is prohibited, picnics are encouraged at Rattlesnake Springs. The reef geology that formed the Guadalupe Mountains has intrigued scientists for most of the 20th century. The sedimentary layers of the ancient reef can be seen in the cliff bands along the drive up Walnut Canyon, the park road that leads to the cavern. Because of the arid desert climate, the layers of the reef are well exposed. Generations of geologists have cut their teeth in this canyon. But studying the reef from the surface is like reading every tenth word of a novel. The real story of the reef is below, in three dimensions. The dissolution of the limestones in the Guadalupe Mountains by sulfuric acid created huge caves. About one and a half million years ago, the process of infill began. Surface waters absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and from decaying plant matter and seep downward through cracks and along bedding planes in the limestone. The carbon dioxide combines with the water to create a weak carbonic acid which dissolves the limestone. The water, now saturated with calcium carbonate, percolates out onto the walls and ceilings of the cave. Evaporation occurs as the carbon dioxide is lost to the cave atmosphere and calcite crystals are deposited in a variety of ways to create the decorations geologists call speleothems. This process was very active until around 10,000 years ago. Now only about 5% of the speleothems in the cavern are growing. Crystal Springs Dome is the largest active speleothem in the cavern. The dome grows upward as the calcite-rich water drips down from above. As water flows down the glistening sides of the dome, it grows outward and thickens. Speleothems created by dripping water can either be stalagmites, which grow up vertically from the floor, or stalactites, which hang down from the ceiling. The rate of water flow determines their size and shape. Because the rooms in Carlsbad Cavern are so large, proportionately large speleothems were able to grow. When water drips less aggressively and just the top of the formation is coated, layers of calcite stack up. The stalagmite grows tall and thin. They are sometimes called totem poles. Draperies are formed by dripping and flowing water coming out of an inclined ceiling. The water first flows down the surface of the ceiling, depositing an edge of calcite as it goes, leaving line after line of built-up minerals. Then at some point the flow comes to an end, meeting a wall for instance, and then drips downward. Several different mechanisms can affect the shape of a speleothem. On the ceiling of the king's chamber, these stalactites first grew as a result of dripping waters. But at some point, due to air flow through the chamber and a subtle change in the water chemistry, 
Calcium carbonate was deposited as needle-shaped crystals called aragonite. It covers the speleothems in the room in a form called popcorn. In the papoose room, dry popcorn-coated stalactites hang above an ancient pool. But in the back of the room is an area of still active growth. At one time, waters must have moved much more aggressively out of a fissure in the cave ceiling. But even now, some of the speleothems in this corner of the great cave continue to grow. On one still active stalagmite, a hapless bat died some years ago and has become entombed by a mineral veneer. Beyond the paved trails of the normal visitor areas are rooms rarely seen. To get permission to go into the deeper regions of Left Hand Tunnel in the western arm of Carlsbad Cavern, you need to have a specific park approved mission. Lake of the Clouds, the deepest known chamber in the cave at more than 1,000 feet below the entrance, requires a steep 300-foot rappel. On route! Next to the point where the rope is tied off is a formation called the Creeping Ear. The formation is an indication that even in the deepest known regions of the cave, airflow is still active. Moist air rich in carbon dioxide flowing up from the room below causes condensation and corrosion. The ear grows out from the wall as material is deposited on the leading edge. Lake of the Clouds is a perched aquifer, a pool sitting high above the water table. Its signature formations, called clouds or mammillaries, are rounded clusters formed under calcium carbonate saturated water when the room was submerged thousands of years ago. Mammillaries form as repeated coatings of calcite cover a small pointed rock projection. Much like a pearl is formed, coatings build up to form the rounded clouds which here have grown together on this traumatic ceiling and form huge cloud pillows on the floor below. is a room that in the history of the park has rarely been visited. To reach the storm cloud chamber requires a short hanging rope climb of 70 feet, an ascent only allowed by special permit. Although the lake below was first seen in 1930, the climb to the chamber above wasn't made until 1982. Modern climbing systems like this rope walker are helping cavers to explore new areas of the cavern. The storm cloud chamber is a beautifully decorated alcove that leads nowhere. Since it was drained before the room below, there was a longer period of time for the deposition of minerals. In the very wet environment that probably existed, a forest of delicate calcite and aragonite speleothems coated the room. Although several teams have visited here to map and photograph, their great care has left the chamber pristine. It will remain off limits, a protected
restricted area that will be left to exist without human interference. Near the Lake of the Clouds chamber and left-hand tunnel is the bell cord room. This is a wet area of the cave and there is a lake here as well. This room is also protected by the park in an effort to preserve one of the most spectacular and delicate sights in the world of caving. A lavish display of soda straws grows as water drips through thousands of holes in a porous ceiling. Many of these formations are still growing. Most are relatively young as speleothems go. Stalactites can start out as soda straws. Calcium-rich water flows down the hollow center of the straw. When it comes to the end and is exposed to the cave air, a small ring of calcite is deposited and the soda straw grows. When the water emerges under pressure, the speleothem can take off in any direction, forming a seemingly gravity-defying helictite. Above the bell cord room is another chamber that requires a vertical rope climb to reach, the Bifrost Room. It was only discovered in 1982. The few cavers who have entered this place have kept to a narrow trail at the side of the room, carefully avoiding the delicately decorated floor. The National Park Service has determined that there is no significant scientific reason to be up here. The room has been carefully surveyed and mapped. It will be closed indefinitely. Human impact on caves has become the single most important issue for the park as management of the resource is planned and debated. Simply closing cave passages is not practical for every cave in the park. On a busy day, up to 7,000 people may enter Carlsbad Cavern either through the cave's huge natural entrance or by taking the elevator to the big room, 750 feet below the surface. Even those who follow every park rule have an impact that creates a subtle change in the cave's environment. As we walk through the cave, we shed hair and skin, leave food, or track other things in on our shoes. A society of cave crickets feed partly off of the matter that we all bring in. The carbon dioxide we exhale changes the delicate chemistry of the cave's air. But lint is what most noticeably coats the speleothems along the cave's trails. Every year a team of volunteers gathers for what is called the lint camp. Around 30 cavers can collect the equivalent of 12 pillowcases full of lint in just one week. Studies show that the lint can trap moisture containing weak carbonic acid. The acid corrodes the speleothems. But there is an even more obvious and disastrous effect that human visitation has had on the cave. More than 20,000 speleothems have been broken and taken from the cave since Carlsbad Cavern was first developed. In the old days, before cave conservation was even considered, Visitors were unaware of the damage done by touching or climbing on the delicate formations. Now we know that the oils on our hands and clothes keep speleothems from growing. Yet the damage continues to a surprising degree, even today. Ogle Cave is on the eastern side of Slaughter Canyon. It is a short but spectacular cave with a very large main room containing huge columns and draperies. In fact, at 107 feet, the bicentennial column was once thought to be the world's tallest. But that distinction now goes to a speleothem in China, just two feet taller. Ogle was mined for bat guano in an era when caves were poorly regarded 
and cave conservation unheard of. Guano miners thought nothing of dynamiting a path through a forest of massive columns. They blew a hole right through a wall of speleothems to run a cable for a trolley to move guano from deeper parts of the room. Luckily, they bypassed Ogle's most spectacular feature, a wall of draperies nearly 80 feet high, formed at a time when calcite-rich waters must have poured out of a joint or fracture in a relatively flat ceiling. Now the cave is mostly dry, the massive speleothems have long since stopped growing. But off the main room, a breach in the sandstone layer above channels calcite-rich waters into an alcove where a small group of glistening speleothems continues to grow. Just beyond is a man-made passage miners began in 1915, intending to tunnel out the side of the mountain to avoid having to haul guano up the cave's 180-foot entrance pit. It was never completed. Much of the mining equipment used in the cave is still in place, now considered artifacts of a bygone era when men using crude lanterns shoveled tons of dusty guano into burlap sacks. Walls of bat guano remain, although the bats have long since abandoned the cave. Yeah, I was looking at that earlier. They've taken a lot of that. The havoc wreaked on the cave by the mining operations is irreparable. It's really perfect. perfect. But local cavers, under the supervision of the park, are doing minor restoration, piecing together some of the smaller speleothems in the dry portion of the cave. But without the flow of calcite-rich waters that formed the massive speleothems of Ogle Cave, the only reclamation the cave itself can accomplish is very subtle. Since 1915, this little drapery has been growing at the entrance to the man-made tunnel that was never finished. It is barely an inch long. About ten miles southwest of Carlsbad Cavern, a group of visitors climb up the sloping west wall of Slaughter Canyon. The half-mile trail ascends 500 vertical feet. Led by park interpretive rangers, the group will explore Slaughter Canyon Cave. The rangers light kerosene lanterns and the group proceeds through the area known as the Twilight Zone. Light from the entrance still penetrates the darkness that will soon be, as it is in all caves, total. Slaughter Canyon Cave is a first trip into the world of caving for most people. Here you bring your own light. The passages are unimproved. The cave is a historical site left much as it was when guano mining was abandoned here in the 1950s. Remember I promised you you're going to be over your head in guano. 50,000 tons of bad guano were removed from the cave in two decades. The steep walls of this guano pile reveal the bones of countless generations of Mexican free-tail bats that inhabited the cave. Some are the bones of a similar but now extinct species called the Constantine well, free-tail that guano, lived 17,000 years ago. The scientists and they believe that it could be about 17,000 years ago. And the guano layer still goes underneath us. Oh, it's still deeper. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Still deeper than this. But guano mining artifacts are not the only evidence that man has entered this cave. Deep into the dark zone, perhaps six to twelve thousand years before the electric light was invented, ancient people used this cave for shelter and as a source of water. Slaughter Canyon Cave has one of the two oldest known examples of deep cave art in North America and the only one in a national park. There are at least 50 figures here in an alcove with a small pool of water nearby. The actual drawings appear as pale yellow stains. Experts believe the figures to be archaic, drawn by the hunter-gatherer tribes who roamed the Guadalupe Mountains long before the Apaches arrived in the late 1400s. The black charcoal lines are a crude attempt by someone, possibly one of the miners, to outline the figures. Clues in the form of artifacts have been found in other parts of the cave, 
suggesting that the cave was well explored long before Western man came on the scene. On this side. The trail winds one and a quarter miles through the main passage of the cave, sometimes requiring the use of hand lines up and down modest slopes. It is a first taste of wild caving for most people, <coughs> and the cave rewards the effort. Well, the name of this formation is, is the Chinese Wall. But the park provides greater challenges for those with the spirit to take another step in the process of discovery underground. On a hot summer day, a group of visitors makes its way down a small canyon just off the scenic loop road. In the wash below is a cave that is, for many, the first real test of their spirit to explore underground. Sometimes it's hard to get people into the entrance of Spider Cave and other tight areas that I sometimes take people, and some of the chimneys can be tough too, but I think uh, myself and the other rangers that lead these trips kind of almost take a little bit of uh, strange pride that we can talk people into anything. Spider Cave is what cavers call a crawly little cave by Guadalupe standards. In the summer, rangers lead occasional tours to the cave for those yearning for a taste of real cave exploration. Though the passages seen on the tour are well mapped and the ranger guides are all experienced cavers, this tour requires a certain level of fitness, and applicants are screened before being allowed to participate. Much of the cave is formed in the Yates Formation, one layer of the reef that contains silts and clays deposited over the reef late in its development. The Yates gives the cave its red cast. It also contacts the Tansa layer, which shows up in the white dolomite walls in some rooms. The rangers who guide this tour tailor the route to challenge each group's abilities. This passage has a low road, but if you dare, it also has a high road. I feel like Jiminy Cricket crawling through here. Almost through. It's a lot of crawling, but um, for me, that's what spider is. It's not necessarily a cave where you can walk into a big open room and marvel at it. It's something to experience on a much more immediate level crawling through it, getting dirty, uh, wearing the cave on your shirt, in your hair, in your ears, and, and everywhere else. And uh, that, that's what Spider is. It's, it's a very involved caving trip, and that's why I think people like it, and that's why I like this cave a lot. There are hundreds of known caves in the Guadalupe Mountains, and the limestone of the ancient reef could contain thousands more. Every year, more caves are discovered in the park. Some may have no entrance and may never see a caver's light. Most are much smaller than Carlsbad Caverns. But the efforts of cavers from around the world who come to the Guadalupes in search of discovery have paid off enormously in the past few years. Back in the 1940s, Lechuguilla Cave was nothing but a pit with some guano at the bottom, known for its 90-foot drop and some undecorated, nondescript passage. But in 1986, a group of cavers drawn by the wind whistling through the rocks and debris on the floor of the pit, after many failed attempts, dug down deep into just the right spot, and one of the world's great caves was discovered. To keep the loose rock from caving in on the original dig, a culvert was installed with an environmental gate so that increased airflow from the new entrance would not cause drying in the cave. Okay. Uh -oh. Lechuguilla Cave has become one of the great discoveries in the history of caving. Because it is overlain by the Yates Formation, 
The cave has been relatively protected from the cleansing effects of flowing water from above. Gypsum, which is a byproduct of the reaction between sulfuric acid and limestone, is still in place. Its discovery supports the theory that sulfuric acid was the agent that caused the great voids of the Guadalupes. In the chandelier ballroom, the ceiling is covered with gypsum, a great confluence of the snow-white mineral which ends in the creation of huge crystal chandeliers up to 20 feet long. The gypsum takes other forms as well. Delicate flowers as big as a thumbnail are extruded under pressure or form intricate bouquets. Crystalline gypsum hairs up to 30 feet long hang floor to ceiling in a room called Darktown. And sometimes, in the convective currents of airflow in the cave, weave themselves into delicate ornaments. Lechigia Cave is a discovery that took considerable faith and effort in an obscure corner of the park. But there are discoveries being made in much more familiar places that are just as fantastic. Caver Jim Goodbar climbs a rope near the top of the cross seating area in the big room of Carlsbad Cavern. His destination is a hole in the ceiling, 238 feet above, called the Spirit World. The hole is visible to thousands of visitors who tour the chamber daily. It is what cavers call a high lead. But because it is in the center of such a huge ceiling, it was thought to be unclimbable by conventional means. In 1985, Ronald Kerbo, then the park's cave specialist, and Michael Queen, a geologist working in the park, led a team of cavers who, with a contraption made of 80 party balloons and what looked like a huge embroidery hoop, were able to snag this stalagmite at the edge of the hole. Having done that, which took us about five nights to do, we uh, now had a cord that reached from the floor up and over the stalagmite and back down to the cave floor. So we tied a climbing rope on the one end of the, of the parachute cord, pulled on the other end, and managed to snake a rope uh, 200, over 222, about 225 feet up uh, to the stalagmite and then pull it back down to the floor, tie one end of it, and then climb up the other side. Trusting an anchor he had never seen, Kerbo was the first to climb. The climb put him in a place no human had ever been, right at the apex of the three great arms of the big room, several hundred feet in the air, spinning like a spider on a thread in the middle of a ballroom. The stalagmite was secure. It took two more expeditions for the team to make its way to the passage on the other side of the pit. At the top, the edges of the pit form a huge funnel. To reach the main passage, cavers must walk on an inclined floor of slippery mud and flowstone. Hand lines have been set along the edge. If someone were to slip without being tied in, there would be nothing to stop a slide down into the big room, 238 feet below. Even experienced cavers take care and move slowly. Across the pit are the chalk white stalagmites that Kerbo saw when he made the first ascent to the room. In the distance, lit by his dim headlamp, they looked to him like spirits. Here the team walks carefully in the same footsteps as the first explorers so as not to damage the virgin cave floor.
Halfway down the main passage is a wall that reveals the fossilized remains of organisms that formed the fabric of the reef. They stand out. Etched by condensation as corrosive elements in the cave air passed across the wall. Stacked in fossilized clumps just as they were when they died and became part of the reef structure over 230 million years ago. Look, you can see these, these tubey things, these tub tubey-like annelid worm. The passage is littered with the remains of dead free-tail bats. Could they have been lost? Or is there another way up and out of this room? The room branches out, but only 800 feet of cave has been found up here. That's okay. There is, however, a crack in the ceiling at the back of the main passage that seems too tight to pass. Cavers have seen what looks like another room beyond. Pat Cambesis thinks that she might just be able to crawl past the choke that has thwarted Still the men on the team. Kind of sides there. It sounds like she wriggles up into the crack, but just as it opens up, a row of delicate speleothems blocks the tight passage. It's so close. Yeah. <laughs> it's so close. By breaking the formations, she could get through. Rather than damage the passage, she decides to retreat. It's tight. It's so close. That kind of makes me feel better. It's a consolation, sort of. But some of these things look like there's been a fair amount of air going through there one time or another. The spirit world isn't very long, nor is it as well decorated as some other portions of the Great Cave. But it as much as any spot in the park, typifies the spirit of exploration that has made Carlsbad Caverns National Park such a special place. From Jim White's first exploration in 1901 to the present, the reef continues to give up its secrets. The question now, and for those who follow, is how do we protect these fragile discoveries? With the spirit of exploration comes the responsibility of preservation. In a world of extreme delicacy, where the rocks can be as thin as a human hair, where natural sculptures are poured by unseen forces into shapes beyond our wildest imaginings, perhaps we must learn to be like the shaft of light, illuminating the darkness, and then leaving without a trace, in a new spirit of exploration.